I think we should finish the informal part and go over to the formal part of this uh, luncheon meeting here. And I have the pleasure to introduce our speaker for this event. You probably all know from your schedule that uh, it is uh, Thomas uh, Jack Lee. Uh, he is the director of the Marshall Space Flight Center. I guess many of you have had a chance to drive through the Marshall Space Flight Center. And there are also some uh, additional possibilities over the next few days which are done by the courtesy of the Alabama Space and Rocket Center. For those trips, you unfortunately have to pay. <laughs> it was nice enough to permit the NASA transportation system to provide some free tours for yesterday and for today. And I hope many of you took a uh, chance to uh, use this opportunity. We unfortunately could not provide places for all the people. That's why we also made the uh, arrangements with the Space Center. Let me just say a few words about Mr. Lee. Uh, he was born in this general area in Wheelowee, Alabama, uh, and he graduated from Birmingham Woodlawn High School in 53. He received a Bachelor of Science in Aeronautical Engineering from the University of Alabama in uh, 58, and he completed the Advanced Management Program at the Harvard School of Business in 1985. He began his professional career in 58 as an aeronautical research engineer. And of course, the Marshall Space Flight Center at that time was still the US Army Ballistic Missile Agency. So in a sense, he is an old timer. He initially worked for the Army, then switched over later at the transfer when uh, after NASA had been established and uh, here in Huntsville, the local Marshall Space Flight Center had been founded. In 69, he became technical assistant to the technical deputy director of Marshall at that time, of course, and he served in that position until 73. Uh, he then served from 73 to 74 as manager of the, what we call in those days a sorty uh, team. Uh, many of you may not have heard or may not recall the team sorty. It is today the space lab. Uh, in those days, we did not want to talk too much of, about space, so we just called it the Sorty Laboratory. And uh, when the Sorty was finally uh, renamed into uh, Space Lab, he even had the big advantage that I always would have liked to uh, uh, have. He could spend quite a bit of time in Germany. You probably know that uh, the Space Lab was uh, in uh, Germany and in Europe, I should better say, for general terms. You probably know that the Space Lab was basically built by the European Space Agency and then made uh, available to uh, NASA. Uh, I have here a long list, in fact, uh, two pages of uh, uh, honors and awards he has received. He has asked me not to read all of them to you. <laughs> <laughs> you probably know that the Marshall Space Flight Center is, uh, his biography says, one of the la largest centers of NASA. I thought it was the largest as a change. So it is one of the uh, Fortunately, Mr. Lee is very much in support of activities like the NSS. He is uh, a co-sponsor of our meeting. You probably have seen some of the displays we have outside. And of course, many of his uh, employees uh, have participated in our meetings. And he also has sent a few people here just to listen in on our sessions. With this general introduction, I would like to introduce to you the Center Director of the Marshall Space Flight Center, Mr. Jack Lee. Look at the, uh, the number of installations and the, uh, the 
acreage uh, and compared that to, uh, to other cities, we would probably be, uh, be the largest. Uh, we do have uh, more than one installation we're responsible for in the, uh, in this, uh, uh, in the southeast. But uh, I uh, would like to welcome, of course, to all of you who are, who are here today. I uh, have an opportunity for the, uh, for the first time in some time to be able to talk to, uh, to a group of people who have not, uh, not uh, involved directly in, our, uh, in our, our business. And so I have the opportunity to talk about some things that, uh, that, uh, that maybe I wouldn't ordinarily. For instance, I would uh, I'd like to take some time today because I don't get to do this very often. Talk a little bit about the, the past, uh, the heritage of the Marshall Space Flight Center, because I'm, uh, I'm very proud of uh, what's been accomplished here in the last, uh, the last 35 years. And, uh, and describe a few of our programs that uh, we're involved in today. And then the end with, the, with how I see where we're going or where we should be going in space exploration. Another thing that impresses me about this group, and I've heard this a, a, a number of times, is uh, your enthusiasm about space. That, uh, that's impressive to me. Because uh, if you meet and, and greet any of our Marshall employees, you'll find that today the, uh, the morale, I think, is as high as it's uh, ever been. And, uh, and we're trying to keep it that way. We believe in, uh, in space. We wouldn't be in this business if uh, space exploration. We wouldn't be in this business if we, if we didn't. In fact, that's what drew most of the people to this organization, I think, in the early days. Our own heritage at the Marshall Space Flight Center was created by, by an interest in space exploration as opposed to, uh, to necessarily looking to a lucrative future in the, in the business. If you look back into the 1950s, it wasn't intuitively obvious to the casual observer that uh, the space was going to go anyplace other than, than for a few people to, uh, to do a little research and then maybe the, the whole program would go away. In, the, um, in talking a little bit about our, our past heritage, we have a very diverse uh, heritage at the Marshall Center. We've, um, with the, the Von Brown team came here in the, in the 50s was with the Army, the, uh, soon formed the, the cadre of the basis of the, uh, the core of the Army Ballistic Missile Agency. And this, uh, as you probably know, was uh, the emphasis at that time was on, uh, on ballistic missiles with the Army and the, uh, the, the threat of a potential Third World War with uh, what, what was going on in Korea at the time. So this country to emphasizing uh, the business of, uh, of, uh, of missile development, principally for, for defensive purposes. That group um, was, uh, was here in the, in the late 1950s. We became a part of the, the NASA and Marshall Space Flight Center in 1960. We were at that time principally a propulsion development center. If you look at what was uh, what went on with the Von Brown team at that time, it was, uh, was really a carryover. It focused mostly on, uh, on, on propulsion systems and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, vehicle systems. If you look even into the, the what may be more familiar to some of you, because you're some of you are a lot, uh, lot younger than, than I am. You must remember the Apollo and the and the uh, and the Saturn series of vehicles. That was the, the Redstone and Jupiter vehicle missiles that were developed with the Army. Kind of the genesis of those. You can see a very close correlation between the evolution of those two missile systems and the first of the Saturn One, the Saturn One B, because of the uh, the tankage and the propulsion, propulsion system. One round team uh, became really established the nucleus of. Uh, of uh, <coughs> Marshall Space Flight Center. It became the core of the center. We built around that all the, uh, the uh, program activities, administrative activities. But the key to our, our success over the last um, 35 years, and up to that time, was uh, based on the Von Brown team, the way it was organized, and the technical competence within that team. You can look back today and see the individuals who headed that, those groups and how they were organized. You'll find that we started as a Marshall Space Flight Center as an organization in very, very good shape. You could not reach us any place in the world. The capabilities not only from a design standpoint, from a test standpoint, but the ability to be able to do actual hands-on and do the, do the, uh, the building of uh, missile systems. If you have, have an opportunity to go through the Marshall Center, you'll hopefully be pointed out to you areas where, where we, uh, the first Redstone, the first Jupiters, the first first stages of Saturn One, the Saturn 1B, and the Saturn V are all built in, the, in our, uh, our, our facility here static tested in our static test facility and the larger ones that, uh, that required the uh, water transportation went down the, down the Mississippi to, uh, to over to the Ohio and down the Mississippi to the, to the launch bay. So we, this group had done it all. We worked under you know, what we call the Arsenal concept of design, development, testing, and, uh, and 
So we started with a very, very confident organization. And it's been the, the challenge of each center director since, since Von Brown was here, and since his team was retired now, uh, to, to be able to maintain that, that level of confidence. In the process of doing that, we have, uh, have been, it's been necessary to diversify. If you, uh, if you look at the, uh, in the, in the early days, our, our first entry into the man systems out of the, out of the, uh, the propulsion development uh, began really with the rover beam, the rover that, uh, that we used to put in Apollo and the uh, first man, in fact, the only man uh, driven the uh, rover uh, to ever be developed in uh, operational to, to degree on the moon. That led us into Skylab after the Apollo, and the, uh, again, a man system, again, a part of our diversification. And then, because of our involvement in Skylab, that we, we became a natural for the, uh, for, for the lead in the space lab, and we worked with the 10 European countries, as you know, as uh, uh, Connie pointed out. Very, very, very successful program, not just because I was on it. I actually got off of it, but I was uh, not removed, but I uh, took another, another position before we actually flew the vehicle, but we've gone to the point of completion our development and uh, testing, and we're reasonably sure at the time it would be successful, very successful program. That involvement uh, pretty much has uh, led us into the involvement we have today in space station. If you look at the, the types of things we did in space, space lab, space center sky lab, we're doing the same or similar kind of things in space station. In, uh, in the 1970s, I'm just kind of going through a little bit of the history, in 1970 uh, we, uh, we had an opportunity to get back heavily involved in, in, in uh, propulsion systems and lost field development. And we got the assignment for all the propulsion elements of the shuttle. We set up the, the shuttle main engines, the, uh, the external tank that feeds that, uh, that engine, those engines, and the solid rocket boosters. A lot of people don't remember today, but we actually did the design of the solid rocket boosters in-house. So we later transferred that to, uh, to uh, the USBI, who now is our, our sustaining engineering and operator of the system. We actually did that in-house. We recognize the, uh, the dynamics of, uh, of the asset phase and what goes with being in a propulsion business. We know that uh, more than likely the, uh, the more critical part of any, uh, any launch uh, system is going to be, be in, the, uh, in the propulsion element during the asset phase because of those dynamics. That's, that's, that's the business we're in and that's the that's business we, uh, we enjoy. We've, um, we also recognize that because of that criticality, you've got to keep your, uh, your very best people involved. You've got to keep them very up to date and up to the state of the art and, and intelligent enough to be able to ask the right questions and make the right decisions. We're, uh, we do that every launch. It doesn't always get publicized, but just yesterday, because of um, an uncertainty in the shuttle main engine, the little spring that we, uh, we can't prove that, uh, that it will last, that it has enough cycles to uh, to go through another another launch, so on the on the locks high, a turbo pump and a shuttle main engine. We have a lot of uncertainty and, and we have a lot of data about it, a lot of analysis. We're not sure exactly what would happen if that uh, that, that spring failed, and therefore we're going to delay this launch. It'll probably be you know, two weeks or more before of, of, of a delay. Very significant decision to make, very costly decision to make. But the uncertainty of what the effect that would be causes us not to take necessarily the most conservative route, but to be, but to take the, have to make decisions like that. The um, in the 1970s also we became even more diversified. We've uh, we've got uh, heavily involved in astrophysics. Our first uh, real program in, the, in astrophysics of any size was a high energy astronomical observatory. Three very successful spacecraft launch, very successful in. Uh, in science of return and, and science evaluation. This involvement in astrophysics led us into the lead in the Hubble telescope. Even though you get, uh, hear, hear a lot about, uh, a lot of people love to hate the Hubble telescope because of the cost. A lot of people uh, would like to, uh, to criticize the agency for large programs like this. In my, uh, in my opinion, and it's, this was from almost the outset, we recognize the science value even though the spirit of aberration is there, we correct it and we'll do that in, in, in this next December. The science return is, uh, is really exceptional, and I think you'll find any scientist in, uh, involved in, the, in, the, in that part of astrophysics who will agree with that today. Um, because of, uh, of, again, our involvement in astrophysics, there, you, you know there are four uh, great observatories, the uh, GRO, Gamma Rho Observatory, went up about two or three years, uh, the Hubble's went up a couple of years, GRO, by the way, is the daughter uh, responsible. The fourth of the great observatories is the 
advanced X-ray astrophysics facility, and we have the lead in that. We're uh, we're heavily involved in that development right now. The, uh, the, the next of the radio observatory is probably in the color CERTA, and it's uh, it's more infrared. It's not even in the uh, in the phase B uh, definition at this time, principally because of, of the uh, the cost of large programs, and I think the science, even though I think it's very good science. Uh, it's not, it doesn't have the highest priority from a science standpoint. It may even be, in my, uh, and I would like to see this, have, the, uh, have that telescope be on the moon. It's a, it's a good possibility, it has a good opportunity, but if they can keep delaying it long enough and come back and do it, I think that would be a good base for the uh, survey. The, the uh, microgravity, uh, in our, part of our diversification, we've, uh, we've, we've been heavily involved in microgravity for a lot of years. Uh, I can remember back in, uh, in 19, uh, about 30, 30 years, 35, 30, 35 years ago, on this venture, I uh, had a lot of ideas about an innovative individual about uh, what we could do with microgravity. We haven't progressed as far as microgravity, in my opinion, uh, over the years. I think we got a little bit too ambitious. We look too much to the application without uh, uh, and, and monetary return before we did the, uh, the proper got the proper basis from a, from a ground-based science standpoint. But in, uh, in any event, we've, uh, we've launched over, uh, developed, uh, launched over 50 individual payloads uh, in the Space Lab and the Space Shuttle since, uh, since they've been, been available. Our emphasis and interest in uh, microgravity around chemistry and, uh, and polymeric uh, uh, materials, so electrical and photonic materials, and biotechnology, principally in the, uh, in the uh, uh, protein crystal growth. And if you, uh, if you I'm not going to go into a lot of details about these. I think in every every session here, I've been looking at the agenda. There's somebody going to talk about the details of all of these, uh, so I'll, I won't try to uh, preempt that. But just to give you an idea of, uh, of our own involvement in, in all the aspects of uh, science and exploration. Earth sciences has been it's another area of science that we have uh, some interest in. It's not as high a priority as astrophysics. So I would say high priority. It's not, as, not as deeply involved in earth science uh, as we are in microgravity. Astrophysics and also uh, solar terrestrial physics. The uh, today at the Marshall Space Flight Center, we can say we're probably fall into maybe three categories: science, uh, 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 or four categories: science, research, uh, operations, and development. And uh, for most of our money, by the way, our annual budget uh, for the last few years has been something over three billion dollars a year. This year is about uh, three point four billion. And uh, that's the coming range of somewhere between uh, 20 and 22 percent of the agency's budget every year. A lot of that is, uh, I'd like it all to go into research and, and uh, space exploration, but uh, a lot of it is buying external tanks and refurbishing engines and that sort of thing. So all that doesn't go in, that's, uh, a lot of it goes into the operational phase. In, um, in operations, I'll take that first. We're, um, our principal emphasis today is to, uh, in operations, is to have the shuttle fly safely. That is the agency's principal primary interest, and that takes a lot of time and a lot of effort when you when you consider the complexity and the precision and uh, of an engine like the shuttle main engine. It comes very close to being uh, being the theoretical uh, limits or capabilities of a liquid oxygen liquid hydrogen system. A very sensitive uh, precision instrument like this uh, takes a lot of a lot of uh, uh, a lot of time and almost have to hand build the thing. So that, that's a costly costly exercise. It was necessary to put that emphasis in design and that, uh, that, uh, that system to be able to fit the, uh, the orbiter's uh, configuration and to be able to satisfy the, uh, the shuttle requirements. So we didn't do it just for fun, we did it because we had to and it was done by, by NASA and the, and the American industry here. The other is um, in operation is utilizing what we have available today. We're not operational in the shuttle. We think we're pretty operational in space labs, but, uh, but we have been uh, getting to the point now where space lab is almost routine as a carrier. We, uh, we have to pay not near so much attention to, uh, to the problems associated with the space lab not working. We concentrate more on the, on the science aspect. We had eight flights last year in 1992. That was the most we've had since we got back in the air after the Challenger accident in 1988. And, uh, and we're, we think we're that significant, more significant part of that. And by the way, we, we have the, uh, from an, from the, those eight flights, we have to concentrate on the, uh, a lot on the propulsion system. But in addition, Marshall was, uh, was uh, heavily involved in the payload. We had, uh, and some of these you'll hear some details about, the International Microgravity Laboratory. It was one of the, one of the first ones that was 
approved the mission managers for that, that, that activity. We had over 200 scientists out of 16 countries involved in that. The next was the, uh, was the ATLAS, the, um, the Atmospheric uh, Laboratory for Applications in Science. Uh, There's going to be a series of these over the next 10 years, and hopefully one a year. And it's to, uh, it has 12 instruments, and it's to, to look at the, uh, the reaction reaction of the atmosphere, not only by uh, affected by humans, but by natural uh, causes, and, and to see changes. It's probably the first, the real uh, uh, results of, uh, of the Earth Observation, uh, BOS, Earth Observation System Program, is, uh, that, will, that you've seen is a, in a different category. But these Atlas missions that directly support that. The uh, U.S. Microgravity Laboratory, there's over 31 experiments in, in that one, and it went the uh, range from a uh, from crystal growth to uh, the fluid behavior. The, uh, the tether system, it was an engineering uh, applied. To all this we had the, either responsibility for the experiments or the, or the mission management. We managed and developed the tether. It was intended to be an engineering demonstration where we'd, uh, we would uh, run out uh, about uh, 12 and a half miles of uh, tether with about 1,000 pound, 1,100 pound uh, satellite on it down the end. It was developed by the, uh, by the Italians. We had the mechanism, the, the tether mechanism. And, uh, and the, there was science involved in, the, in determining the electrodynamics of a, of a conducting tether. The, uh, it wasn't totally successful. We, um, we didn't get the, uh, the tether all the way out. But the, uh, the, what we did learn about the, uh, the science standpoint and the dynamics and control, and that's the principal reason for the tether, the dynamics and control, we feel very comfortable that we understand what, what did in fact happen or go wrong. And we've had uh, a number of reviews inside and outside to, uh, to determine whether we'll fly it again. I'm not sure what the date will be, but I'm confident we will fly it again. The, uh, one of the reasons is because the, the intent of this program was to try to understand whether how useful or how, how well we control, could control tethers in long distances. There's a lot of applications, I'm sure you've seen there, but you can generators to, uh, to, to, to transfer momentum to, uh, to, uh, to be able to increase or decrease the uh, uh, altitudes uh, on, on orbit, to uh, dragging a satellite or spacecraft through or sensors through the upper atmosphere. There's a lot of applications for, for tests. The disposing of, of waste is another. We need to prove that system uh, one way or the other. Is it, it's a good, an app, a good application or not. Space Lab J was an international cooperative mission between uh, us and the, the Japanese. And some 24 uh, science, the material science experiments on it, and about 20 life sciences experiments. And I think. Uh, I think Larry Lucas is here and talk, we'll probably talk about, uh, about some of that. From a development standpoint, most of the development in the, in the present shuttle system will be around improving the, uh, the shuttle main engine. The intent here is to be able to increase the liability and margin in the engine, and we're, we're focusing on major things like the, the turbo pump that we have problems with now. We have another contract and we're in development of, uh, of developing a, a new uh, turbo machinery. We feel we're, talking, we're thinking about increasing the diameter of the, uh, of the, uh, of the, uh, the nozzle. All these things to increase reliability and, and to increase margin in the system. We'd like to get the shuttle main engine to the point where it's not, uh, not the, the most critical, at least the, not, not the, uh, so obviously the least reliable part of the, part of the system. The, um, we are developing an advanced auto rocket motor in a, over in Mississippi. Town called Iuka, Mississippi, which is one of our installations. And, uh, it's under our control. We've um, a lot of controversy about the advanced solid rocket motors. Uh, the objective of that motor was to, to increase the reliability and reduce numbers of, uh, of single point failures in a solid rocket motor. At the same time, increase the, the payload capability by about 12,000 pounds. Those objectives today are being met. There's been uh, some overruns of the program because of uh, stretching out the program and misunderstanding in the early part. We, are, uh, we believe that we're on track to, 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 put, to get that uh, system developed and into the, into the shuttle system. There's, uh, the controversy is over whether you really need it or not because today the present solid rocket motors are, uh, are, are performing uh, at, are acceptably. And these, these are redesigned motors after the challenge. The reason that and every time we fly we get a little more confidence in the present system. The reason that, you're, uh, that you get more confidence in it is when we return them, we're able to, uh, after the launch, we're able to, uh, to tear them down and inspect them. And the, that, that system has worked exactly, even better than we designed it. Uh, you're familiar with the, the Challenger, the, uh, the, the O-rings, so we have two O-rings, the primary O-ring and the secondary O-ring. 
it prevents the, uh, the hot gas from escaping. We have never even gotten hot gas to the, to the primary O-ring in these solid rocket motor designs. They said we have traps before you get there, which are not principally was not intended to, uh, to prevent that. We've never even gotten hot gas to the, to the primary O-ring. So, uh, in fact, we had, to, uh, we had to flaw the system to be able to qualify to see if the primary O-ring truly would work. So, so it's not, not, not a problem. Um, that though we'll always come up in the Congress, I believe, on whether we have a whether it's a, uh, a proposal <laughs> or increase the capability, capability that exists uh, that's proposed there will probably be the driver, and it may be the configuration we go with on the space station. On whether we need that extra capability, it could very well the space station could very well drive the uh, the, the requirement to continue the development of the SRM. The advanced X-ray astrophysics facility, we're in the, in the early phase of development there, and, uh, and we, we're changing our way of doing business a little bit. We're doing part of that in-house and part of it contracted uh, out, and uh, as of today, we're on our on the right schedule, or on a schedule, which we established for ourselves, and we see, and we're getting adequate funding for this. The Congress has not taken an opportunity this year, for the first time in a few years, to, to reduce the, the funding available. We are uh, in the, in the Development area, we have uh, we're focusing on advanced development for, for a number of propulsion systems, and these these have come from from studies we've done from advanced launch systems and, and new launch systems and space lifters and, uh, and that sort of thing. We're uh, we're focusing mostly on the, on the liquid propulsion systems as well as solids and hybrids. Hybrids are going to be uh, are becoming much more attractive to to the industry and to us. Our problem is that we didn't uh, didn't start with the technology and advancing. Uh, development of these systems sooner, I think we'd see today there'd be more hybrid, uh, hybrid rocket engines in the, in, in, in the end of it. Space Station is the, is the last of the development I'll we'll talk about. It's got a lot of publicity and I probably can't tell you anything uh, new about Space uh, space Station. Uh, I can remind you that there's a lot of controversy over Station today. Uh, country over, uh, controversy focused in, um, in darn near every area. Uh, its costs, capabilities, Requirements, uh, the uh, schedule, management, configure. I can't think of anything. It's not controversial in somebody's mind about space station. <laughs> that, uh, that gives us a uh, gives us a little problem, and uh, no question about it, because uh, of, uh, of uh, the, the number of people and organizations this affects. I'm not sure. I hope today that we are with our redesign teams and the, and the, and the business between the uh, the uh, Congress and administration and the agency, we can in fact uh, are, are converging on, on a solution. I'd, uh, I'd like to say that. Right now today, I'm, I'm not really sure it like where I stand, whether we're, we're converging or diverging on the system. It's a room. It's I know terrible. one thing, but we are heading for a uh, for confrontation, and that uh, confrontation is going to be this this year, it's going to be this summer, and it's going to be as a result of, uh, as a part of the, the budget cycle, and the position the administration and the agency takes on the confrontation, unfortunately, is kind of like the number of the areas of, uh, of controversy. It involves the administration, the agency, the Congress, the internationals, and some, if not all, the, uh, the existing contractors on the, on the space station. So we've got controversy, and we've got confrontation, and, uh, and how it's going to come out, I'm not, I'm not sure today. I would like to, um, I believe there will be a space station. I believe that there will, uh, that there will, uh, that there will satisfy uh, the objectives ultimately. But then, uh, I don't know how the Congress is going to gonna vote or how the Congress is going to see this thing, and uh, nor do I know how the administration, of course, they're going to The administration so far has the uh, pretty well supported space station. Uh, they haven't heard too much from the president or the vice president. The White House could be anybody from uh, from the uh, the uh, Panetta, uh, who used to be a congressman, and now the head of OMB, to uh, to uh, Gibbons, who is uh, now pretty well focusing on what the vice president is used to in the uh, space council standpoint. Well, what about the future with all of this? Uh, you know, it looks like we're doing good at Marshall, and I can't say the other agencies, the other centers, could probably give you a, a summer uh, rundown on how, how well they're doing. What about the future for, for NASA? Uh, how NASA goes is the way Marshall Space Flight Center is going to go. That's, uh, we're part of that agency, a very vital part of it, and we don't separate ourselves from the agency. Let me first say that uh, I think this country today has the, has the knowledge, 
has the experience, has the ideas, has the capabilities, and has the planning to do a lot more towards real space exploration than we have, have money to, to, to pay for. I say that because I've, uh, I've heard in some, uh, some speeches people say, well, we need to wait and see where we need to go. We need to learn this before we go there. I, uh, I think that uh, it's a matter of deciding uh, exactly which direction we want to go. And, uh, and, and I said we want to get there. I'm not talking about just NASA. I'm talking about the, the country, the American industry, as well as uh, 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 as NASA, and uh, I'm also talking about the international. There's a lot more. If you add this, uh, add the whole capability of those things I just mentioned, and experience, and ideas, and, and, uh, and resources uh, within the world, we can uh, we can do just about anything we, we choose to do. I believe. Given the conditions in the country today, though, with the uh, in this country, and I not, may not be too different in other countries, with the economic situation first, with uh, deficit spending. More conscious, more I believe, more, more emphasis and more concern this year by the, by the general public and the Congress, and the Congress in particular, maybe the administration about deficit uh, that I've seen in a long time. People are recognizing the the, uh, the, the, the problem there and, and they're concerned about it. Not necessarily know how to solve the problem, but they, that's part of the agenda, part of the understanding. The uh, the fact that the Cold War is ending. Going to have uh, clearly has an effect on it has an effect on the defense spending reduction and it has an effect in general on our, our aerospace industry capability. It has an effect on our Congress. It has an effect on our Congress because it's still uncertain today yeah, that bring them over, whether yeah, over the years, over the last 30 years, that the Congress has voted for a, for a healthy space program to, to help win the Cold War, or whether it was for interest in space. The kind of things that we want, we, we've got to get across. To. If it's only for the uh, you know, for the winning of the Cold War, we've got some problems. In We've got about a, over 100 uh, new congress, freshman congressmen. They're uh, they're a different breed of people. They uh, they uh, they don't vote the party lines necessarily. They're independent. They're independent thinkers. Even the old heads in the, in the congress can't figure out where uh, how they guys are going to come down. And they do a lot of, uh, of uh, our space advocates do a lot of, uh, of, uh, of encouraging and, uh, and trying to sway the uh, these young congressmen. But they're they're just non-committal. So there's some uncertainties in this. Business. But if we're to move uh, move out in space, and uh, we need to, uh, we need to recognize our mission objectives, and I keep going back to, um, to the famous uh, Augustine Report, which really wasn't the Augustine Report, but that's what everybody calls it. I uh, I think I can't can't identify four more clearly uh, mission objectives for NASA than they did. I mean, it's obvious to me. You know, everybody may want to, to juggle them around and call them uh, use different words about it, but there is clearly a need for this country to have a mission from planet Earth. We've got to get outside of lower orbit, lower Earth orbit, and we've got to explore space. There's clearly a need in, uh, from, from a, uh, a mission uh, to planet Earth with interest, in, interest and emphasis on, uh, on environment. And that's probably the one of the most talked about things, and probably the most uh, misunderstood of, the, of, uh, of any of the, the space uh, uh, concerns today. But there is an interest in environment. There should be. And we've got to focus on that. So there's a, there's a mission to planet Earth. Clearly, science has uh, is, uh, got to be foremost in this uh, is endeavor, as well as technology. Those are the four things that Augustine came up with, and I can't think of a better four things that we should focus on in the future. If we're to move in the uh, into space, though, and assuming those were our mission objectives, I haven't seen uh, any real objection to those. And, uh, we need to focus, and we need to focus on specific, some specific things. The space station, for instance. I'm a strong advocate of the space station. There are all the reasons why you need space station to save land programs and to save uh, uh, the environment, or, uh, which is not a good argument this time to put uh, uh, an inclination we're in, unless we go to a 51 degrees of inclination. But uh, we need a long term laboratory in space. We just finished the last launch, we finished one year of on orbit time. Out of that one year, it took us 12 years to get, to get one year of time in orbit. All that was the laboratory time. Use the laboratory uh, scientists. Uh, you had to go to the, into your laboratory every other month to try to try to, 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 uh, to develop a, a new uh, pharmaceutical, a new medicine, or anything. And you only you, had, you only go in your lab periodically. And you never would get there. That's kind of where we are today. We need a long-term uh, space laboratory so we can really understand the benefits of this microgravity and the absence of, of gravity. We need it obviously for human adaptation to space. If we're going to go outside more, we're going to go to Mars to go further. 
But you're going to have to understand better the physiological aspect of it. If you need a space station, there's no other reason for those two reasons you need that. You, uh, we need, uh, as a, another focus, we need to continue our aggressive, uh, uh, aggressively pursuing the, uh, the Earth observation system. Now it's, uh, it's had some funding problems like other uh, programs. I think when it was about a $17 billion program, it, was, uh, it seemed like it was right. I think, I think it's probably less than $10 billion now, and it seems like it's not, not, not really sure whether it's uh, that's the adequate uh, level of funding. What I think we ought to focus on, though, that's mostly monitoring of the, of the, uh, of the Earth. What I think we ought to be focusing on in, in parallel, this is my own, own opinion, is some corrective action to what's being monitored. You look at the, you've got to do that. You don't need to wait for 10 years to be able to get the monitoring done and then try to start signing correct, corrective action. You need to do these in parallel. That needs to be a part of the, part of the overall program. We need to begin, begin the development. This is not just because I'm a, uh, a Marshall Space Flight Center employee and we're in the promotion and the vehicle development business, but we need to have, seriously start developing the, the, the next generation uh, transportation system. I think with all the studies we've done in the advanced launch system and, and the new launch system and space lifters, we can clearly meet commercial needs, which is uh, which is there. It's recognized. Marketing surveys say we're going going out of business in the, in the commercial launch business. If we don't do something, commercial guys say they can't afford to uh, to do the technology to get themselves in the, into the competitive position. I think we've satisfied the military requirements. I think we can satisfy the civil requirements. They're not too unlike. You know, we're all looking for more economic, more efficient systems, and we're looking for about the same uh, same capability with an evolutionary uh, capacity. In time, we're going to have to replace the shuttle. There's, uh, you can look for probably another 10 or 15 or 20 years, but in time, the shuttle will, will, will have to be outdated, will be outdated, and we're going to have to replace it. And, uh, and these, uh, these transportation systems be, should be driven by cost. And, efficiency of operation as, a, as opposed to performance driven. We know how it is to what it comes in a, in a performance driven uh, propulsion system. High reliability and high margin, increased margins in the system. And we can do that. We understand that today. You don't have to, to, uh, to go with the highest performance. I believe, I believe we, need to, we should begin to focus the technology on the technology development for manned Mars mission. I think we ought to do that right now. And I think we can, we can identify where those technologies are. Clearly, in either uh, nuclear or electric propulsion, that have that, and have the, uh, the, the, the thrust and the uh, and how specific to do that. Oh, we're going to have to, a lot of uh, emphasis oh, got to be put on the radiation, the manned effect of that. And I believe that uh, we ought to increase our emphasis on bioregenerative environmental control systems because that's going to have to go with it. And once you stay in long duration, uh, very long duration, you've got to have a better environmental control system than we have today. To do these things, I think it, uh, it fits the, uh, the administration and the agency's uh, plans and, uh, and, and policies that I understand today. And that's international cooperation. I'm talking about a different kind of international cooperation than we are used to. I'm talking about interdependence and international cooperation. So that you take the whole world's capability and, uh, and not uh, try to, because you know, somebody's going to be competing. But, but uh, from a cost standpoint, we would make this so interdependent that we're all sharing, sharing in, the, in the cost of the development of vehicle systems that, uh, that give us the common goal. We're going to have to do that if we, we go to go Mars in time. In the process of this, we've got a relevance is, uh, to, uh, to dual use technology. We get this on the part of this administration, which is now factoring into all of our thinking. That I think we can do. Dual use technology, relevance to, uh, to competitiveness of American industry, and at the same time be able to, uh, to, to explore space. Third of these uh, relevance is, uh, is that education. We've already demonstrated, I think, within our agency, and, and other agencies have too, that there is a factor of relevance to what you do and how you how you put something back into the educational system. And, uh, and I think that's extremely important. My opinion, uh, if we're to move uh, out of the space, we're also going to need other things. We're going to need public support. Public support seems to be uh, still positive, but uh, I, could, uh, I could get a trend in the, in the wrong direction. In order to be able to get public support, it's going to be through conferences like you have here and organizations like you have and your interest in that sort of thing that gets us uh, that public support. And it may be, in the long run, the thing that puts us over the edge to get it done faster and more, more effectively. I thank you. Any question you want to ask, and if I can't answer it, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get you an answer. I see a couple of people in the audience here who, uh, 
talking about money. We're embarrassed by asking them if they don't know the answer because they work with, with NASA. But I'd be happy to try to answer anything, anything you want to ask. Yes, I've been reading in the newspapers and the magazines that we're redesigning the space station Freedom when we don't know the objectives and the requirements. If, if this is true, how can we really redesign it? Well, I, I guess I don't, uh, I don't agree with the, with the fact that we don't know, don't know what we want. You know, just, just take the two things, that, uh, the two, two objectives, and you expand those into a lot of detail. And that is, we need a long-term laboratory in this place. We've gotten uh, user requirements we've been accumulating for, for years on, on other programs, so that there's, there's, there's users there, and customers who, uh, and this is a paying customer, science kind of customers, who, who need uh, a long-term laboratory. The other one is obvious. If we're going to spend a long time in a long duration of space, you need the, uh, you need the long-term exposure from a physiological standpoint. I think in the process of, uh, of doing both, you have a, have a creative atmosphere of a, of a laboratory in space that does it. So you're satisfying long-term object may even be a, a secondary one. At the same time, you're producing. There's, uh, there's just, uh, if you know, I don't have to listen to Larry DeLucas's uh, uh, presentation, but here are these guys that have been up there and, uh, and, and who have got result, gotten results in the, in the microgravity. You're, uh, you're going to, uh, in my opinion, you've got to have them. The, uh, the other part of it is, uh, I think it's, uh, I think the international aspect of it is, uh, is worthy of consideration too. It would be a primary objective, but I believe it's, uh, it's, uh, it's the start of a cooperative effort that's going to be essential for the future. And I think it's a good way to do that. Uh, you can say, well, is it worth uh, you know, $15 billion? Or, uh, and the only, only couple things I can say there is that uh, all the money stay on Earth, by the way, and, uh, and you are, in fact, uh, creating uh, 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 things that are useful on Earth in the area of pharmaceuticals, for, for sure. <clears throat> but uh, but you're, uh, at, the, at the same time, are, uh, are, are keeping an agency together, which I think is essential. You, uh, we don't have a plan right now, for sure, to, uh, to keep the, uh, the MAN program and the future exploration that's not in some way tied to space station. The, uh, the other part of it is uh, there's a lot of studies been run. You've probably seen these uh, more than I have. That, uh, that, that, and they're legitimate studies, not done by NASA. I'm not I say NASA. <laughs> <laughs> they are legitimate studies. <laughs> but they, uh, they show from 8 to 10 uh, to 1 return on an investment. Now, this, they, they, they go through the details of what it is of, 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 uh, of how that's related to the electronics industry to manufacturing and so if you believe that you could almost say it's a you can't can you beat that investment you put up a, a billion dollars a day it may take you 10 or 15 years uh, to get the 10 10 billion back in, in return you can't do that in the back on that so I, I, I just uh, I relate the, the whole thing to uh, to uh, the future space exploration now just to do it because it's there I don't think that's the case I think it's worth the investment just to determine if this long-term uh, uh, utilization of a laboratory environment in space for the absence of gravity is, in fact, uh, worth it. That may, that may tell us something, too. Yeah, well, a lot of uh, is, you know, is got to give it my opinion, and uh, uh, I think the Russians would like to go uh, directly to, uh, to Mars. A lot of people in this country say there's a lot of around the moon. We've been there. Let's go to Mars. Um, I, uh, uh, that's, that's kind of a giant step, and things like the, the developing of uh, nuclear propulsion systems, and that may take a, a little time. What I like about the, uh, the lunar part is uh, we have identified uh, a number of, uh, the moon, by the way, is a pretty good uh, uh, platform for science. The telescope is a very, very clean environment. We, uh, uh, we can use it for, uh, going back there, you can use it for science, you can use it as a precursor mission. Use it to develop a, uh, a kind of a step at a time uh, environmental adjustment to, to go on to Mars. That in conjunction with uh, with uh, taking the, the right time to, to develop the technologies to get there in the most effective way, I would, I would think that would be a little bit different, I think, than we have with the last time. It would be more associated with, uh, with uh, preparing ourselves to go further and at the same time more science. That's my opinion. We've uh, there's a number of studies around uh, external tanks in orbit. Uh, 
the most recent one is to, uh, that we've seen again, we've seen it before, is to put it in orbit and use it as a strong bag for other things uh, like uh, space station. It's, um, it's never panned out as a, as a strong bag in my opinion because you, you, have to, uh, you have to make a pretty good commitment if you start putting an external tank in orbit. You've got you to keep it up there, you've got to be able to control it, and you've got to, uh, and, and especially if you, uh, if you don't want to come back in, if you don't want to come back in, or allow to come back in, you've got to be able to control that. So you're, uh, you have to put some things into the, into the investment in the present tank, which takes away from this present performance, uh, to be able to say, I'm going to put the thing up there, leave it in orbit. Then go high enough in the, into orbit that you, can, that you can't have it in control of. Um, there's, uh, there's been uh, some studies, a uh, number of studies, in uh, making a large telescope out of, out of the tank. There's right. others to make it from a habitability standpoint, like those guidelines. None of them uh, have been, uh, been feasible enough to, in my opinion, to, to make that an investment of uh, getting up. And there's some companies, more than one company, maybe in uh, Bill Sunny, you know, that, uh, that we have some amount of understandings with. Uh, to, uh, to fly things on the external tank is, uh, is uh, kind of an experiment, but I don't think that's ever really produced anything yet. There will be time, so there will be a time when, uh, when it'll be worth our while, based on probably after we're already up there, and have the capability to, uh, to translate the large structures and control them there. And I think that an external tank in orbit would be the right thing. A lot of uses for it. Yeah. Has there been anything on the, uh, the new launch system program, the, uh, in the uh, give, give a little bit of history in the advanced launch system, we did it must have been two or three thousand studies, and we were uh, we went with that in a big way to be able to uh, to uh, to put new technology in. On the new launch system, we decided we would build out on existing technology as opposed to, to, uh, to, to new ones. One thing that has come out of that that we've progressed since the uh, end of this is uh, aluminum lithium in the external tank. We learned enough in the process that we're, uh, that's one of the candidates for increasing the weight capacity and capability for, uh, for the space station program. I think we'll go with it, so that, that's one. Uh, there's, uh, there's another one in electromagnetic uh, actuators, uh, which is uh, we've we progressed since we started the, the program. In the time we first part of the NLS, we said that wouldn't be ready. And by the time we start a space lift or NLS, we will. Those, those two for sure. So we're going to have. Anything else? Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Lee, it's appreciation for your speaking here at this conference. I'd like to thank you for this certificate. Uh, before I can it be, I'd like to just hold it up. We made up a certificate for our speakers, and some of you will be getting them later. Um, it's got some artwork screened in the back of it. This artwork was a uh, piece developed by a martial artist, Jack Hood, back in 1971. You know, Sid's got a uh, large Von Braun type space station in here, a uh, big space telescope, some EVA, development of a of an advanced-looking uh, deep space transportation system and some kind of aerospace plane. So, Mr. Lee, and appreciation for your uh, talk to our group. And I also want to extend that appreciation. Marshall, as a co-sponsor, has uh, done quite a few things for this event with society here uh, this weekend. They have, of course, gave us this free tour. They also have uh, opened up the NASA Teacher Learning Resource Center and made that available to us gratis. And, uh, They've had this out in numerous areas to include programming. So thank you once again. Thank you.